Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here for Joyrider TV, live with some more Q&A at this new later time. I hope this time is working for many of you. I know for those of you in Australia, um, you were staying up too late anyway to watch the Q&A. Um, but apologies to everyone in Australia who now has to watch this afterwards rather than live. Um, but hello, and yes, I am coming from Langaban in South Africa, just to the north of Cape Town. You may have seen in uh, Show Us You Cat that went out a few days ago. Was it a few days? Yeah, a few days ago. Um, you m that might have given you a bit of an idea of what this place is like. But I would say it is an absolute sailor's paradise, albeit perhaps on an average day, a little bit chunky in the wind department, much like um, the champagne that we enjoy in Vasiliki, Greece. It's quite a similar vibe uh, down here in Langaban, which is just north of Cape Town. Um, just like to say hello to everybody who's already tuning in. Thanks very much for coming. I hope, let me know how this new time works for you, by the way, if you're watching live or in the comments below, if you're not managing, I suppose if you're not watching live, then does it really doesn't make any difference, really does it, apart from the liveliness of the guy at this end and the amount of questions that are coming in, of course. Yes, yeah, so hello to Max. Who is there? Max says, hey, Joe, hope you enjoy SA. I had 17 knots on Lake Simsey today. Just two degrees centigrade. Oh, my word. Crikey. Yeah, it was significantly warmer than that here today. I think probably in the arena of about, uh, must have been, without the windage, probably about 25 degrees here. Max continues, and this is one for the community, um, is anybody looking for a good crew for the round Texel or round Furman race, um, which are both big uh, races that take place in Europe? Um, yeah, Max is a very nice guy. He's a good cat sailor. He's probably, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, he's probably weighing in somewhere in the vicinity of 100 kilograms. So if you need to keep that boat pinned down, Max could definitely be the right guy for it. But he's a very nice guy. And uh, if anybody is thinking of doing one of those events and you're looking for somebody to sail with, then just put it in the comments and I'll put you in touch just giving the camera a rub there all right nice to have you on board max and we've got robin on board in florida hello robin great to have you with us as always and then we've got laura on the other side of the usa in santa cruz california hello laura great to have you with us then we've got mark and janet hello uh somewhere in the middle of the usa i believe and then we got Forrest in South Dakota, USA. We have the return of Hutchie. Hello, Hutchie. It's been a while, I think. Uh, nice to have you back. And then we got John Claude in the Dominican Republic, I believe. Oh, greetings from an overcast Trinidad. Nice. I messed up and forgot my plugs. Sunday, I had to, oh no, had to be towed in. Everyone at the club is calling me two plugs and pluggy. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. So you could be the best. You could be a, you could be very good at sailing, but would they call you John Claude, the good sailor? No. Um, you could be really good at helping people pull their sails up. Will they call you John Claude? There's the helpful sail pull-up guy. No, you loot, you forget your bungs once, and there it is. You're going to be called Pluggy uh, 
for the foreseeable future. So it's an important lesson for everyone. Don't forget your bungs or plugs. Uh, first thing you do when you go to rig your boat and the last thing you do before you put your boat in the water is check the bungs. Definitely. Um, a hilarious story. Um, we were doing an event at Rutland Water in the UK and um, there was one of the lads, he was going out on a tiger and he put the bungs in, put the boat, then he put his boat in the water. Uh, his boat didn't have the bungs in and it actually turned out he'd put the bungs in on the tiger next door to the one that he was going sailing on. So do check several times because it is easily done i might um i'm just gonna switch to spectacles hope you don't mind um all right just means i can see the live chat a little bit easier we've got enrico in french guyana nice 30 degrees bit rainy could be worse okay nice to have you on board and we've got patrick Good morning from a wet and windy San Diego. Yeah, tell us where you're watching from and what the weather's like. Here in Langebaum today, it has been blowing dogs off chains. No word, well, it's not actually true. There were no dogs being blown off chains, but it was certainly very windy. Um, I did go out and do a bit of filming for um, an upcoming video. Uh, which I should have out in the next couple of days. But um, in the afternoon, this was probably the, did some excellent training in the morning. Uh, if, you did, if you didn't get the memo, what I'm doing here in South Africa is I've been invited down here by um, some guys who sail a Hobie 16. They're very new to it. And they got me down here to do some coaching with them. And... Um, did some excellent work this morning. You could actually see where I went on Strava. So if you follow me on Strava, you can see uh, the kind of action we were looking at. Um, and then after lunch, uh, went out for a sail and it was probably blowing, getting on for 30 knots of wind. And of course, I'm away from the safety of Vasiliki Bay. No safety boats. and. The way the wind is here in Langebaum, uh, when the tide was, um, what was the tide doing? Tide was coming in and wind was going against the tide, forming these dirty little standing waves, which made it very difficult, uh, made the boat feel a bit like a bucking bronco. And um, it made it very hard, very difficult sailing conditions. And I had the dilemma because when we were double trapezing, going very fast um, and everything was going well, it was really, really nice. But it's those times when you're not sailing fast, double trapezing, like when you're going for a manoeuvre or you have to go and fix something on the boat. Those times in those really high winds when bad things can happen a lot easier. When you're at full speed and you're playing the main sheet, in theory, that is the easy bit. It's the bits in between which do become, which are more difficult. So I had to decide, do we continue um, and continue being perhaps, let's say, a little bit reckless with the amount of wind that we were hitting, or do we turn around and come back in? Much safer option. So I'd have, what we did is we turned around and came back in. It did seem like the right thing to do. Um, but it meant we weren't out sailing for very long, but it was ever so windy. And also, I wasn't sure on the depth of the water. So if we did capsize, I knew that the water's certainly not deep enough for the, the boat to invert without hitting the bottom. So if we had have capsized in that wind with these waves, 
uh, we could have seriously damaged the boat. We could have really got into a bit of a situation. So I thought, you know what? Better to go back in and live to sail another day with the boat in one piece. Sorry, just got up there. Um, yeah, so that's um, what it's been like here. We've got Gaz Gaz on board. Hey, mate, love the show. Love that you're here with us, Gaz Gaz. Thank you very much for tuning in and to everybody else who's tuning in. Uh, haven't got many preloaded questions this week, just the one. So I think I'm actually going to steam in and respond to that preloaded question right now. Uh, of course, if anybody has got any questions, um, just put them in the live chat and I'll see if I can answer it. So here we go. This question is from James, who's in Australia, so he obviously couldn't make it now. He says, what is your opinion on inflatable cats like the mini cat? Are they too slow? Um, so they're not worth it, or are they still fun? And what are the pros and the cons of these inflatable catamarans? All right, so I've, oh, I've got a whiteboard, by the way. This is new. So I think I might even try writing. Um, this is nice, plus and minus. Plus meaning positive points, minus meaning slightly less positive points, which you could call negative points. So uh, the first one in and the most significant on the plus points is storage. Storage. Like that. These inflatable boats, when you pack them up, like the mini cat, they fit into basically what is like a, a large suitcase and then the mast would come into pieces as well. So if you live in a city, for example, and you've got very little space, you could actually store your catamaran under your bed. Wow, that is very good. And how handy would that be? Um, also, with the size, uh, storage and transport. Oh, man. It's been an emotional day. So emotional that spelling has gone right. Transport. So next one, the transport. Because these boats pack up so small, yes, you could actually put your catamaran in the boot of your car. Wow, amazing. Um, what's next on the positives? I would say the next one on the positives is you don't need a massive piece of water. So um, you can, what would we call that? Um, more, uh, can we call it, no, is versatile the word we could say? All right, let's say versatile. Versatile. So we've got that versatility of being able to sail pretty much anywhere. Even on quite a small river, you could take your inflatable boat because a lot of them don't draw very much. They don't have deep dagger boards. They just have these uh, kind of skegs that come down under the uh, inflatable hulls. Um, also, lightweight, they're light, so moving them around, very easy. That lightweightness of the inflatable boat will also make it easy to write after a capsize. Easy to write. We are really racking up the positives here for the inflatable boats, like the mini cat. If anybody happens to be watching from mini cat, and if you would like, 
to send me a mini cat to test in Vasiliki Bay, I would be very happy to test one. I've been trying to get my hands on one of those bad boys for quite some time. Um, I could test one and then send it on to the next place that you want to test it. What else? They're not as expensive. Um, so price. This is all. There's some good points here for the inflatable boat. Um, anything else? I'd say relatively easy to sail. Easy to sail. And I think we could probably finish. We could probably finish on the positive points there for these inflatable boats. Um, yeah, I might even think of some others. But all right, negative points. Out comes the red pen of doom. All right, what's the first one? Obviously, an inflatable boat is not going to be as quick as a fiberglass performance catamaran. Um, so we could say negative point slower. But turning that, neg turning that negative into a positive is actually, because they're slower, this means, I wonder what this yellow is going to look like. This means, oh, I don't suppose we can see that. Oh, just about. Um, this means that we can actually sail the boat on these smaller bodies of water because we're not, going so fast that we have to put in a tack or a jibe quite as often. So the boat is certainly going to be slower, um, smaller. Which would mean if you are into some family sailing, perhaps, like if you wanted to take the kids out for a sail, um, you're not going to have as much space as on a conventional catamaran. So they are smaller. Um, what else would be a negative point? They do have inflatable hulls. Is there a chance that they could pick up some sort of puncture? Mm, let's, let's put it down here, I think. So um, maybe you might put a... Yeah, I'll just write puncture, puncture, question mark. Um, any other negative points? No, I don't think so. I think um, the main negative point there is that they're not as quick as the conventional catamarans. And maybe one is, does it have... A trapeze. I'll just write trap. Yeah, because uh, one of the nice things with cat sailing is, of course, getting out on the trapeze. So I think there you go. There's the pros and cons of the inflatable catamaran. But I think if storage is an issue, um, if you know, you could have your inflatable boat in the boot of your car all the time. Or, um, you know, maybe you've got to go somewhere on business and, you know, there's a small lake nearby. You, would, you wouldn't actually tow a boat on a trailer to a business meeting. But could you put one in the boot of your car if your meeting finishes early enough? Just drive down to the lake, pump her up and off you go. Nice sail. Lovely. Um, I think they really do um, deserve a good place in the catamaran market. So well done to the inflatable boats. So there you go. All right, we're checking back in with everyone who's checking in. We've got Mauricio from Dallas. Great to have you on board. Hope everything's good there in the state of Texas. Um, yeah, in the state of Texas, does everybody know where they need to be and when in Texas? All right, start of June, um, where in Texas, can't remember, on the coast, uh, start of June, on the, co the Texan coast for 
the Prindle 50th anniversary um, North American Championships. Even if you haven't got a Prindle, I would get down there because I think that is going to be, there's going to be a buzz around the place. Um, if you're into a bit of cat sailing, you haven't got a Prindle, get in touch with the guys who are organising it. There's a Facebook page. Uh, just join that Facebook page. See if you can get on a boat as crew, perhaps, that kind of thing. I think this event really deserves to be one of the greats of the season because 50 years of Prindle, now that is worth celebrating. So get involved if you are able. All right, Gaz Gaz says, I have a Dart 18. How fast can it sail? Is there a limit? And have cats got a limit? All right. Yeah. I used to sail a Dart 18 back in the day before I turned to, um, well, before I started working in Greece, which naturally put me on to, well, it put me off the Dart 18 and on to the Hobie 16 as one of the standard boats that we use there. Um, and when I was sailing Dart 18, that was before the days when GPS devices were so readily available. So I don't actually know what sort of top speeds I was hitting with the Dart 18. But I would guess, um, put it in the live chat or in the comments if you know otherwise, but I would guess a very good speed on a Dart 18 would be about 22 knots. I'll just uh, let that hang for a second. Twenty-two knots on a single trapeze boat. The Dart 18 is a bit narrower than the Hobie 16 as well. Um, the two boats, Dart 18, Hobie 16, were always getting kind of compared because um, on the handicap. So if you're racing against different types of boats, you have the handicap number. Um, the handicaps of the two boats were very similar. Uh, the Dart 18 actually being one point quicker than a Hobie 16 because of the hull length, it's uh, two feet longer. Um, always being compared, but the Hobie 16 is so much more powerful. It's got a much bigger rig. Um, but I think about 200, uh, 200, 22 knots would be a good target speed for a Dart 18. Thanks for the question there, Gaz Gaz. Oh, have cats got a limit generally? So I think I might sneeze in a second, by the way. Yeah. Hey. Whew. Whew. Okay. So, yeah. You know, when, when it's coming, what can you do? Um, sp top speed for the sort of small catamarans that we talk about here generally, I'd say is something like 25, 26 knots is top speed and that is absolutely exceptional to get one up to that speed that would be like a i'd say probably in a year the amount of people around the world sailing small catamarans doing more than 25 knots is probably less than 10 so that is quite exceptional to go that fast all right, Forrest says, that sounds nice, laugh out loud. Oh. Um, yeah. Just bought a used Hobie 16 and the mast has to be stored in my bedroom and a hallway. Oh my goodness, wife loves it, I'm sure. Oh my word. Yeah, storing the mast in your bedroom and hallway, that is really testing uh, the relationship if your other half doesn't happen to be a sailor. Yeah, that's that's a stretch. Well, good luck with that, Forrest. Um, all right, Mark and Janet say, any opinion on the Hobie getaway? I'm tempted by a project boat on Facebook for only $800. I think the Hobie getaway, um, it's not, what I would call a performance catamaran. It is a boat for learning on, 
Uh, it's very durable. It's got the, um, the plastic hulls, which will last for a very long time with zero maintenance. It's got the wings as well, which is very nice because it gives you a, a large trampoline surface because it pretty much doubles the size of the trampoline with the wings there. Um, so I think what would probably be nice, let's, hold on, we've got, we've got more technology here. Sorry, I'm doing stuff while talking. I hope that's not rude. Um, oh, hello, what have we done? So I've become a bit derailed here. Maybe I shouldn't have. All right. Sorry about the interruption there. Yeah, so the Hobie Getaway... Uh, you've got the wings on there. It's a plastic boat. It's not going to be as quick as the fiberglass boats, but as a means of getting out on the water, I think it's a great option. Uh, they are used by a lot of higher centres, as we saw in San Diego. Um, so very popular, easy to sail. Um, what else? Not too powerful, so good wind range on them. I would expect the, with those plastic hulls, it to be a little bit on the heavy side, maybe. A little bit on the heavy side. Um, but for $800, if it needs fixing up, this could be a really good idea to get the boat $800, fix it up, maybe even find a trailer um, there are a lot of trailers out there for sale, especially in the USA. Find a trailer that uh, maybe needs a bit of work on it, fix that up, and then sail the boat for a season. If you like it, keep it. If you don't, you could sell it on. And this could be a new thing, a new way of getting hold of different types of boats, uh, giving them a little refurb, and then selling them on. Uh, for that sort of money, like if you do a bit of work on it, and advertise it for like $1,500 afterwards with a trailer, uh, somebody is going to take that very quickly. So I think, I think it's worthwhile. I think it's a good idea. All right, Mauricio says, when the boat capsizes and the mast is stuck in the bottom, what do you do? Yeah, I sort of had that scenario yesterday. Um, it is a real tricky one. How can we illustrate this? Um, we can't. I'm just going to talk about it. Yeah, so if... All right, I'm going to draw it. All right, so if this is the water, here we go. We're off now. Uh, the boat is going to be green on this sit on this occasion so and then there is the mast the boat wants to invert but it has been stopped from inverting by the seabed so here's the seabed here and then what is probably happening, because the boat is trying to invert, it probably means that the wind is blowing this way onto the bottom of the trampoline, forcing the, um, forcing the mast under. So we did have this scenario happen yesterday uh, because the water is quite shallow in some parts of the lagoon here in Langaban and we did capsize, mast did go in the bottom. How did we fix it? All right, so what we did is we took the writing line over the hull like normal, but of course you can't write the boat 
when the wind's blowing onto the bottom of the trampoline. And um, fortunately, the seabed here is all sand. But what we did is hanging off the writing line, we then got right to the bow of the boat. And by getting to the bow, what that does is it means that the boat is then kind of forced, but it has to rotate because we're changing the kind of pivot point. Here, it's trying to pivot on the mast, but it can't. But if we get the bow down as well, then the boat wants to pivot a lot quicker. And as soon as we got into that position, it really freed up the mast from the bottom and we got the boat righted quite quickly after that. So I would say if your mast's on the bottom, get right to the bow, but at the same time hang from the writing line because that's going to help to take the pressure off the mast. Yeah. If it was completely stuck, oh, then that's a tough one. If it doesn't work by going to the, the front of the boat, what could you do next? Go to the back of the boat. These are pretty much your only options. And one way or the other, hopefully, would do the trick. But if, if you go towards the back of the boat, if it's not one of the bigger catamarans, if it's not an F-18 or a tornado kind of size boat, if you get both people on the boat right to the back, hanging off the writing line, you can actually turn the boat on its, um, on its sterns. So it can go from, let's, all right, how are we gonna draw this? So, so it can go from here, and you're right, at, can we see this? You're here, it would then go like this, it would then go like this, and we can actually roll the boat over. It takes quite a lot. When you get to this point, you haven't really got much um, to put your feet in. And once you get to this point, the boat will actually roll over quite quickly, and it will end up on the other side. And that might actually be enough to free it from the bottom. So there we go. All right. I hope that's a good answer there, everybody. I thought it was a very good question and quite strange that it actually happened just yesterday. All right, who else is on board? Right, we've got Laura in Santa Cruz. Who says, question. Should you back the main or the jib first when you are caught in irons? As skipper, I'm working on backing the main, the larger sail. Yeah, it's, um, it's very effective. If you do get stuck head to wind, um, so here's the wind. So here's our boat. Um, the two things we can do, which Laura is talking about here, is let's have green sails today. We can either back the jib. So if we get stuck head to wind, we can back the jib. We first, in fact, the first thing we need to do is make sure that the mainsail is loose. If you've got the main one of the things that is going to cause you to stall more than anything is too much main sheet. What the main sheet does and the mainsail does when the boat isn't moving forwards is it brings it up towards head to wind and in a lot of situations will actually bring it to head to wind. So if the rudders aren't working, the main sheet will bring you head to wind. So number one, release the main sheet. And then number two, get the jib in on the, on the wrong side. And at the same time, we want to reverse the rudders. Because head to wind, 
no main sheet, jib on the wrong side, the boat is going to go backwards. So the boat will go like this. And then once your boat is going backwards, what we have to look for is when the boat stops going backwards and starts going forwards again. Because of course, if we keep the rudders there, when the boat goes forwards, we're just going to turn back into the wind again. Um, so you just really have to look for when the boat starts going forwards. As soon as it does, straighten up with the rudders and off you go. Lovely. Um, you can also experiment with how much you pull the jib on the wrong side. What you can do as the crew is just grab the jib sheets from the wrong side, pull it over, and that might be enough to pop it uh, onto the other side. Um, but like Laura says, should I use the mainsail to, to get it going? And I would say, if you want to get out of this uh, stalled position as quickly as possible, then yes, it is actually what I do myself if I'm helming the boat and I have stalled it. So the way to do it with the mainsail, this would be probably in up to about 16 knots of wind. In more wind than that, as long as the mainsail's loose, get the jib on the wrong side, that is enough. But in less wind, what you could do is just move towards the middle of the boat and push on the boom. And then what you're doing is back winding the mainsail, which is really gonna get the boat round that corner very quickly indeed. So um, what we what um, children used to be taught when sailing uh, the small dinghies is if you get stuck, it's push, push, pull, pull. So push, push is push the boom, push the rudders backwards, pull, pull. We're not doing that so much with the catamaran. What we're doing more is slightly when it's going forwards, be very gentle with the rudders. Don't try to force it. Allow the boat to bear away. And only once you're moving forwards nicely should you start to bring the main sheet back in. There you go, Laura. I hope that helps. But definitely, if you want to get out of irons quickly, back wind the mainsail. All right. All right, John Claude says, when jibing, do you have to let off the main sheet the same way you do in attack? Or can you jibe pleated? Yes, you can jibe pleated. Um, what I would generally do before the jibe, in uh, possibly even in any wind, I'm really changing my tune on jibing just since last year, is... Before you go for the jibe, bring the traveller in a bit to about halfway, like the toe strap. And by bringing the traveller in, what you're actually doing is the, you are encouraging the sail to go across to the new side much sooner because the wind will get on the new side of the sail a lot earlier if your traveller is in. And then, all right, it continues, I do it sometimes, but it jibe feels a little bit violent. Yeah, so the best thing you can do to prevent the jibe from feeling violent is firstly, you definitely need to be jibing from the right course. So the right course for jibing is a proper broad reach. So, um, what am I actually doing here? Right, let's put the sails in. So the proper broad reach is when your wind indicators on your boat are going straight across. Very important before you go into the jibe that you are on the right course. The next thing, if you want your jibe to be as silky as it possibly can be, is to, if it's quite gusty conditions, is take a gust. When you get that gust, you 
actually need to turn more downwind to keep this apparent wind at the same angle. Um, yeah, so you get the gust, turn more downwind to keep the apparent wind the same, and then at that point, you're actually sailing faster. When you're going downwind, the faster you sail, the less load you have in the rig. So sailing fast, that's gonna help. What else is gonna help? By sailing deeper, it means you don't have to turn the boat through as big an angle when you go into the jive. This is definitely gonna help. So going faster, smaller jiving angle, and then when you actually go into the jive, we've already talked about the sail, bring the um, traveler in to about halfway, and then bring the main sheet in a little bit, but yes, you can uncleat it. Um, if it's really windy, people would say, oh, that's bad, but I do it myself. If it's really windy, when I go into a jibe, I'll have the main sheet reasonably tight when I go into it, but I'll uncleat it. So when it fills on the new side, it can just run out of it, and that takes some of the sting out of that jibe. Uh, the other thing, you need to be turn and don't slow down the rate of turn until the boom has come across. If you slow down the rate of turn before the boom comes across, the boat is going to slow down, the rig is going to load up with pressure, and that's going to create this big slamming across of the mainsail, which you certainly don't want. So speed is your friend when it comes to jiving, but don't go looking for speed by sailing close to the wind. Make sure you're starting off from the right angle. Um, what you can also do is, if it is particularly windy, as soon as the mainsail has come across, straighten up and then get on the new side, look forwards as soon as you can, then adjust your course. Cool, I hope that helps there, John Claude. All right, we've got Dave on board. Yo, how you doing, Dave? Great to have you on board. Very nice to have you on board. Lovely old job. That's, uh, of course, Dave, Dave at Lake Lanier, Georgia, who's got a very nice yellow Hobie 16. We, Patrick says, 2002 Hobie Tiger, laminate sail. Can a small tear to the leech by the sixth batten down be successfully patched with repair tape, or do I need to get it to a sailmaker? Oh yeah, this happens quite a lot actually. The leech on these sails, uh, they do go sometimes on the jib more than the main, but yes, you can patch it. What you, um, what you want to be using is like what I would call sticky Dacron. So don't use, you, if you go into a chandlery, a lot of the time they will sell this stuff that, called, that says on a, it's like on a roll, which says sail repair tape. And it's, this is more spinnaker repair tape. And it's only like that wide. But if you can get a sheet of sticky Dacron, like maybe a meter square or something, um, then you can definitely repair the leech on your mainsail. The procedure would be to, um, firstly, you want to really clean the sail. I would, after having washed it and dried it, I would use some acetone to make sure that the sail is as clean as possible. Because if it's not clean and dry, then whatever you stick to it is just going to peel off. And then... Um, let's draw a picture. All right, here is the back of the sail. Let's have, yeah, it's <laughs> a good picture. Then these are the battens. There's a batten there, batten there. Let's draw. What usually happens is there's a seam on the back of the sail which is probably about half an inch uh, to an inch wide. And it'll be 
along that seam is where the sail will split. So we'll just draw the split here, which would be like that. So that's the split. So then what we want to do with our sticky dacron, this sticky dacron is also known as insignia because it's actually the material that the sail insignia and sail numbers is made of. But you do need a, a good, a big amount of it for the reason which I'm now going to explain. What we want to do is get as much of this more glue on the sail is going to mean it's going to stick better. So what we want to do is cut a piece of this sticky Dacron insignia that goes maybe twice as far back as the tear, round the corners. And then what we're actually going to do is have that, but twice as big. So if it was laid flat, it would be like this. We still there? Yeah, like this. And then we're going to fold, before we do anything with the sail, we're going to fold this piece of repair tape effectively in half. And then I would usually take something like um, whatever you've got to hand, like a piece of wood or a, a ruler or something that you can just score, really make a good sharp fold in this piece. Um, and that fold is going to locate at the actual back edge of the sail. And then we're going to have half of this on this side, the other half on the other side. So it's going to be really a solid repair. Um, and then once we're happy with all of that, we then have the tricky task of peeling off the backing. Now, to peel off the backing, because it's going on both sides, is a bit tricky. So the way that I would do it, which makes it a bit easier, is where you've scored the sail and got that fold in there, then just cut through the backing just there. This is a little bit tricky. Takes a steady hand. Don't cut too deep, because you'll go through the cloth. Um, and then that means you can stick on the first side, turn the sail over, and then stick the second side. Um, and then with this sort of repair tape, what I would then do is take a cloth or perhaps the paper that came off the backing and really give it a good rub. So you're heating up the glue. By heating up the glue, it means you're going to get a more permanent repair. There you go. Hope that helps, Patrick. All right. We've got Lon on board. Hi, Lon. Lon says inflatables only have one rudder. So this could be on the negative points for inflatable cats. Can you fly a hull if you've only got one rudder in the middle? There we go. All right. Patrick says did a full rudder rebuild over the winter including re-riveting the tillers to the stocks. Much better now, thanks for the videos. Great, that's really nice to hear that someone has taken the rudder servicing video, done the full service. And then, like Patrick says, if you really want your boat to feel much nicer and where your rudder stock, where your upper casting uh, joins the tiller arm, if there's some rattle in there, if it moves from side to side, and you've got the tools or you know someone who can do it, then put in some new rivets. That makes a big difference. All right, Forrest says, I bought a used 1980 Hobie 16. Didn't come with any main sheet blocks. Is there a cheaper option than dropping 300 US dollars on new blocks? Yeah, I would say keep an up. If it was me and... I wanted to get a main sheet on my boat. I would just keep an eye. If you're in no rush, this helps. Just keep looking on eBay, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, all of these places, any shops that you are on the internet that might sell main sheet blocks used. And um, 
in the past, I've picked up a full set of Harken. Harken is definitely the best brand of blocks for the sort of boats that we're using. Uh, that is, this is how you spell it in case Harken. Made in the USA. They are new, they are reassuringly expensive, but sometimes you can pick up a set of Harkins on one of these sort of um, websites for not too much money. But I would say you if you can get the full set of main sheet blocks for two hundred dollars, then that is pretty much gonna be as good as you can find. It's definitely worth doing because it does make a big difference to the sailing experience having nice blocks on the boat but it is going to cost you a bit i'd say personally ebay but facebook marketplace is um certainly very popular these days all right gaz gaz says thanks mate top man thank you gaz gaz um dave said catachu yeah, it must have been when I sneezed. Rich, hello, Rich. Rich says, look into the light. And then he says, bless you. Oh, that was when I, oh, okay. Look into the light for when you're going to sneeze. Is that right? That's a that is a top tip. I'm going to try that next time. If you are about to sneeze, look into the light. Uh, let me know if it works. All right, Dave says, different kind of boat flipping. Oh, yeah. All right, Max says, this is Max, who's looking to crew for someone in the Rondon Tessel, the Rongi Tessel, uh, round Texel race in Holland. And there was another race he was looking at as well. He says, you're right, somewhere between 90 and 100 kilos, around 191 centimetres tall. So he can he can definitely bring the boat back up right after a capsize. All right, you're welcome, Laura. Thank you very much. All right, David in Devonport, Tasmania. Must be quite late there, David. Uh, thanks for staying up. Out of interest, which GPS watch do you use? I've got it just here, in fact. This is the Locosys GW60. Um, I've been using this for, I don't know, three years now, maybe four years. I really like it. Um, the reason I went for this, because it's not a big brand, but I went for this because it's the official GPS watch of the Windsurfing Speed Sailing Association. Now, the windsurfers seem to be a bit more organized on this speed sailing than us cat sailors, because it doesn't seem that there's anything official um, online that you can just get involved with. So um, yeah, I've been using this, and let's see if you can see this, yeah. So as well as the top speed, it gives you your stats. Oh yeah, because the top speed, here we go, it says 20.27. Um, and then it gives you the top speed for two seconds, which means it's not just some sort of GPS glitch. It really did happen. So my top speed for two seconds on here is 19.99, which means there was a 0.28 of a knot, um, perhaps little flutter. So, that's very nice. And then it gives you 500 meters, 100 meters, uh, and so on. So that's the one that I like. Um, but there are a, there's a tremendous amount of GPS watches out there. <clears throat> I think Garmin are probably leading the charge with the most. So, yeah, there you go. That's what I use. Thanks for the question. At this point, I am just good, a bit late, 54 minutes. I'm going to take a short commercial break for everybody watching later. Yeah, there's, that's the, um, 
it's usually just water, unfortunately. Um, okay, we have got Pedro on board. Hi, how you doing? I think that's Pedro down in Chile. Hi, too bad internet to watch live. Ah, sorry to hear that, man. Um, hopefully you'll find some good stuff. All right, Mauricio says, Facebook Marketplace, I have Harkins for 175 US dollars. Now that is a bargain. Someone should get that. <laughs> I don't think they'll be there for long. All right, Forrest says, I don't think the owner before had a main sheet block at all when he was sailing. Is that even possible? Um, I would say it. No, not really. You've got to have a main sheet. All right. So, John Claude says, thanks, Joe. Thanks, John Claude, for the question. That was a really good one. All right, we've got Jack on board. Hello, Jack. Any chance you know of a good place or places to buy decent secondhand Hobie 14s in the UK? I'm based in Manchester. All right. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. to. Uh, there's not like a central point who are there's not as far as i know there's not so many places that are buying and selling used catamarans i would um what would i do it actually if you want give me the details of what you're looking well it's obviously what you're looking for there but um i could put out a short video uh to the global joyrider tv community to see if we can find anything. The video would go something like this. Here we go. Hello, yes, it's Joe here for Joyrider TV. As you know, one of the things I like to do is to help to put people and boats or boat parts together. Today, we are looking for a Hobie 14 in good condition in the UK. If you're in the UK, you're selling a Hobie 14, then get in touch, put it in the comments, send me an email. I uh, have got a buyer. His name's Jack. He needs that Hobie 14 because he wants to be giving it the beans for this coming summer and so on. So, yeah, so that's what I could do if you want, Jack. Maybe just this is going to find a Hobie 14. But um, send me an email and I will do what I can to find you that boat. It's a very good choice. There was a Hobie 14 open meeting down here at the weekend, and there was, I think it was about 20 14s. It was really, really great to see uh, nice boats. Okay, so there we go. I think thus concludes today's Q and A. So thank you to everybody who's uh, joined. Thanks to everybody who's watching later. Um, Oh, if you say your email, yeah, I can type it in. In fact, total joy rider at icloud.com. Boom. Cool. All right. So, yeah, there we go. So there'll be some, some sort of video coming out this weekend. So make sure you watch that. Otherwise, I will see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. Thanks very much. Great time. Laura says it's a good time, West Coast, 9.30. Okay, so yeah, let me know in the comments, did this new time work for you, everybody who's been here live, or did you prefer the old time? I think I've got a feeling this new time is better, unless you're in Australia or Tasmania, of course. Thank you very much. See you soon.